Well, we have a fun morning in front of us here. Um, I want to almost make a disclaimer as we get going. We are continuing is, as our habit as a church family, going through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. This morning brings us to 2 Peter chapter 2. And the reason I say that as a way of disclaimer is we teach the Word of God full strength. I believe God says what He means and means what He says. And we are going to tread into some deep, dark territory this morning. It's not our habit to do that every Sunday, but I have to be faithful to the Word of God. And this is the Word of God being faithful to us to show us some of the traps, some of the pitfalls that might present themselves in the world around us. So as you're turning to 2 Peter chapter 2, let me just kind of give a real brief overview. Peter's opened up in this letter, his last letter, actually we could almost make it his last will and testament, his final words to the church he loves so much, those who have obtained a like and precious faith with him. So it's really in-house, it's dealing with believers and addressing believers, and he's addressed to them the idea that he's about to depart this earth. His exodus, his putting off his tent is at hand, and so he wants to lay down some things to remind them, most of which is that you can count on the Word of God. He gives the example of his experience on the Holy Mount of Transfiguration, seeing Jesus in His glory and hearing God speak out of heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And yet, eclipsing the brightness of that experience in Peter's life, he would say, we have the more sure word of prophecy which you would do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and morning star rises in your hearts. That these words of God, Genesis to Revelation, the scriptures have been given to us that we might make it safely home. Kind of like a lighthouse for a fisherman out on the sea. Keep your eye on the light. And you'll make it through the billows and through the waves and through the rocks and shoals. And you'll come into that safe harbor we know as heaven and glory with Christ. And so Peter gives us this exhortation speaking about the word of God, prophecy. And I would just um, kind of include in that, I didn't, I didn't say this last week, but it, it bears saying in Revelation 19.10, this is what we read. We are to worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. The message of Christ is the heart of the word of God. And anytime you get yourself into a situation where you're confused or maybe people are confused, using you, and you don't know, is that true? Is that right? Can I trust that person? Can I trust what they're saying? We fall back on the Word of God. Psalms uh, 138, too, says, My Word I have exalted above my name. This doesn't change. Culture changes. Season changes. People change. And in fact, we learn from Peter that men die, right? They put off their tent. Experience fades over time. But truth always shines, and the word of the Lord endures forever, okay? And so I just want to bolster you with that as Peter would address us as those who have obtained we are in possession of now a light and precious faith, that faith that Jesus Christ, God himself, became man. Emmanuel, God with us. He lived a sinless life. 
And then he went to the cross in our place, paying that debt which we couldn't pay, that we might have that life eternal in him, that we would have that light and precious faith, and that we know that we are heaven bound. But, and this is how chapter 2 starts out. If you look at your text, but, <laughs> but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there were false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Or, the King James says, lingereth not. It's a coming. There's a day when God balances the scales, and He knows those who are His, and those who are not. And Peter is encouraging us in this. Jesus tells a parable in Matthew chapter 13, one of his many parables, the parable of the mustard seed. And that tree, that seed grows up into a tree. There's really a, uh, a type of mustard seed in the Middle East that grows 12 to 15 feet tall. And it says that the smallest of seeds grows into this huge tree and makes shade for everybody. And then the birds of the air come and nest amongst its branches. And if you go with the idioms, with the word pictures, those birds of the air are foreigners. Generally, the wicked and the evil. The ones who he said in the previous parable come to snatch away the seed, that word of God that the farmer scatters on his field. And these birds are going to come into the tree. There's going to be false teachers that come into the church that they might deceive you. And he wants us to be ready for this. Uh, Paul says something very similar in the book of Acts. And it's uh, one of the verses I just absolutely love. In Acts chapter 20, I'm going to pick up at verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Cover to cover... Paul can say, I have taught you the word of God, the prophecy of Jesus Christ. Verse 28, he goes on, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. This is really kind of pastor to pastor. Pastor Paul to whoever might be preaching in the pulpit on any given Sunday. For I know this, that after my departure, again, just like Peter, He's leaving behind a record for those of us to follow. A set of footprints, if you will. After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, and not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Same message, different preacher. Peter, Paul, Mike, go down the road. The word of God never changes. And Peter would repeat. In fact, he said the word repeat four times in last Sunday's lesson. I don't think it's bad that I repeat these things to you. It's good for you. And in fact, Peter, Paul, myself, all we're doing is really repeating the words of Jesus Christ in his Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, at verse 15, we read, Beware of false prophets, says Jesus, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or thing? figs from thistles. That's rhetorical, of course not. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, 
nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, verse 20, therefore by their fruits you will know them. False prophets, ravenous wolves, you can see them by their actions. You can see them by their lifestyle, by their character. And that's what this bulk of this chapter is going to be, is a, is a list of the way to identify false teachers. Now, he started out false prophets, okay? Speaking of those of the, prior to the New Testament, those who have been sent with a message of God, that's what a prophet is, a messenger. He speaks forth the word of God as God gives it to him. And sometimes in speaking forth the word of God, he may even foretell what is to come because God knows the end from the beginning. But there were false prophets. You could almost say anti-prophets or pseudo-prophets is literally how that reads in the original language. They look like a prophet, they walk like a prophet, but they talk like a duck. They're not prophets, but they make that claim to it. False prophets. Now, remember we said in the book of 2 Peter, uh, you can almost lay it up against the book of Jude, and I'll probably give you some of those allusions. In Jude chapter 11, he talks about three of the false prophets, one of whom we'll discuss today, Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Okay? And uh, again, Peter is going into the Old Testament. He's going back into the Word of God to help us grow strong in the foundation of what God has said and done. Rather than going out into the world, the smor smorgasbord of false religions and uh, ideology and isms and just picking and plucking different thoughts, we go back to the Word of God. It's the final authority. It's the complete authority. It's full with everything we need to live a life of godliness. Okay? And so Peter's going back. He's mentioning that. And then the false teachers that are going to come in, just like Peter, I mean, just like Paul warned after my departure, ravenous wolves will come in amongst you, dressed in sheep's clothing. And just so that you know that, this wolf dressed in sheep's clothing. What, what do you think sheep's clothing is like? I, I, I can't help but get the Sunday school mentality of a wolf wearing a, a wool cape. But truly, a better description of that would be a person in the pulpit that dresses like a pastor, walks like a pastor, and teaches like a false prophet. That's that wolf in sheep's clothing. They deceive. It says they come in secretly, right? One of the trademarks, one of the earmarks of these um, false teachers is they do things cunningly, deceitfully, secretly. They have a hidden agenda, okay? This is part of the beginning of our fruit inspection. Bringing in destructive heresies. You know, destructive heresies. A heresy is any theological construct or concept, any teaching about God and the things of God, about salvation and those kinds of things that do not bring wholeness and health, but they bring destruction. They're falsely labeled, if you will. It'd be like getting a prescription bottle with the wrong label on the outside. If you take that bad prescription, you're going to get probably bad, even deadly results. But it looks like a pill bottle, shaped like a pill bottle. The label says it's a good pill bottle, but it doesn't match what comes out of it. And this is these heresies. Now, a heresy, just to be clear, is a false teaching. It is a false doctrine. Doctrine is simply another $5 word that means teaching. And we use it in the church to speak of the teachings of God, the teachings of the Word. And in fact, if you're looking for kind of a little bit of framework to figure out, is this a good doctrine or is this possibly a mislabeled, dangerous doctrine? 
Three things you can do. You can ask yourself as you look through God's Word, is this something that Jesus taught? Is this something that the apostles and the new church followed? And it is something that is taught in the New Testament through the epistles. If Jesus taught it, the apostles followed it, and it's recorded in the New Testament for us, you can line that up with the words of God, the teaching of God, we've got good, sound doctrine. If it doesn't fit into that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's aberrant or malicious or deadly, but you need to be really careful once you start dancing, dancing outside of the lines that God has given us, right? When you start wandering outside the sheepfold and into strange territory, strange doctrines, then you can get really quickly confused. So, these come in secretly bringing in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them and bring on themselves swift destruction. Uh, this one just is, breaks my heart, right? That people would come in to a pulpit, into a position of leadership, a teacher of the church, and they would even deny, it says, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord who bought them, paid for them at such a high price. I, I, I love what Peter says back in 1 Peter speaking to the church. If you, okay, that's called talking to us, if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, he's a fruit inspector, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, okay? Sober up, take stock as you behave, knowing that you were not redeemed, you were not purchased, you were not bought back from sin with corruptible things like gold, silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but, and you were bought, you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and blemish. And for a person to get up in a pulpit and start denying Jesus Christ, the biblical Christ, the historical Christ, the actual Christ whom the biblical record and all the secular historical records support, and start saying things like, well, you know, he's like the brother of Lucifer, or he was once a man and he became exalted to Godhood. That is denying the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to be careful. These are destructive doctrines, okay? Poisonous heresies. And, I'm, you know, I'm stepping out a little bit here. I may step on a toe or two this morning, but certainly Peter does. Shock! Peter steps on people's toes. And remember, we talked about 1 Peter, 2 Peter. 1 Peter is so eloquent. It's written in the finest, most refined, classical Greek of the day. It says that Sylvanus was his secretary, and no doubt he contributed a lot to polishing up the rugged fisherman's verbiage. But here, in his last will and testament, Peter shoots straight. He pulls no punches. There's no fancy, flowery words in here. He's just laying it down like it is, team. Okay? They bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. This is the saddest part of all. It's not just that some person gets on a tangent and somehow gets it in his head to start spouting off something that he can't support in the scriptures, but that he gets followers. And, and we're going to see how that develops. And so it's not just like one, but you can take out a lot. This is why, as a shepherd, as Paul preached to the elders gathered on the shore in Miletus back there in Acts chapter 20, we need to be on the lookout for and when these ravenous wolves, dressed in sheep's clothing, enter in, they need to be dealt with straight away, right now. In fact, that's one of the ways that you can get me out of the pulpit. It, with, with our board, with the churches that hold me accountable. 
if I fall into gross immorality or I began teaching heresy and I do not repent. You have every reason to talk to the board and have me kicked out. I will say this. Saying something wrong, misspeaking, oops, did I say that? That doesn't count. But if people bring to you something you've said and you just double down and you just get stubborn and you just say, no, nope, that's the way it is. I don't care what the Word of God says. That's time for that person to go. Okay? That's what Peter's trying to let us know. He's trying to protect us. It says, verse 3, For by covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. It lingereth not. God's going to get them. Don't worry. God's going to get them. They don't get away with this forever. And you may look, and you may see things going on in different things on TV or in the community or different places, and you wonder, Lord, how can you allow this to happen? God's got the number. God will take care of them. It says, by covetousness, they will exploit you. And really, it's kind of a, a two-sided thing here. They are, they are covetous. That means they're greedy. They want that which God has not ordained for them. That's what covetousness is. Having this craving, this desire, this lust for stuff that God hasn't given to you. Okay? Wanting other people's stuff. Maybe being envious of those things. But in this, it's not just that the false teachers are covetous. But what they do is they lure you through your covetousness. They promise you things they cannot deliver. Health, wealth, prosperity. Just confess Jesus is Lord and live happily ever after. Oh, oh I want that. So you go to their church. You throw the money in the offering. They fill their pockets. And more have followed them to destruction. So this is these destructive doctrines that could come into the church. Now, verses 4 on through uh, 11 is going to be more like the impending doom. If you're wondering what ever happens to these, because it can be very frustrating, this is what happens. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly, and deliver righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of wicked, parentheses, for that righteous man dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then, and this has all been one sentence, is why I just keep reading. Then, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness, despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reviling accusation against them before the Lord. Whew. They're doomed. Okay? God will judge. And he uses fundamentally three groups here. He judged the angels who left their proper dominion, their proper estate. They, they didn't stay where they were supposed to be, but disobeyed God. He judged the ancients, the pre-Diluvian people, those people who lived from the time of Adam until Noah, before the deluge, their pre-Diluvian, okay, the ancients, he judged them, and he judged Sodom and Gomorrah. So again, Peter brings biblical examples here to help us understand the things that God is trying to get through to us. Okay, in these last days, there will be false teachers. Okay, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. That word for hell here is the word Tartarus. And Tartarus is, is 
In the Greek mythology, that's where the Titans would be sent. Basically, it translates into the biblical word, the abyss, the abusal, the bottomless pit, okay? And in uh, Revelation chapter 9, we read a little bit of description. Uh, I saw a star falling from heaven to the earth. The star is a picture of an angel that's fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Tartars, it's not a good place, okay? Often in the New Testament, we see the word in our English, hell, and it can be translated in a number of different ways. Generally, in the Greek, it's Hades. Hades, as Peter has alluded to, is the place of those who have died and are awaiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Prior to Jesus' sacrifice for the saints, paying the debt and going to the prison and setting the captives free, those who died went to Hades, and Hades is just the abode of the dead awaiting their judgment. In the case of saints, those who looked forward to Jesus' finished work on the cross, to Messiah, to their deliverer, when Jesus finished that work, he came and he brought them with him. Okay? But there was another part of Hades, which is Tartarus, if you will. That is a not a good place. We, knew this, we see this in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we hear the story of the rich man and Lazarus the beggar who are in hell. Jesus tells this story, and in there, the beggar who fared poorly in life, there in the afterlife, awaiting Jesus' finished work on the cross, he was known to be in a place called Abraham's bosom, or close to the heart of Abraham, in a place of peace and comfort, awaiting Christ. But there was a chasm, and on the other side of the chasm was a rich man. Lazarus used to sit at his, um, the end of his driveway, if you will, right? And he would get crumbs off the table of Lazarus, or off the rich man. And that rich man was tormented in flame, just asking, just a drop of water for my tongue. And, and Jesus says, it's not going to happen. You can't, that's impossible. Once you have gone to this place of waiting your final judgment apart from Christ, that's where you remain until the great white throne judgment, which comes at the end of the millennium, which all are raised to stand before God and be judged to the lake of fire, okay? So, just there's a little bit of a, a theology on heaven and hell for you right there, and how that's gonna break down. Um, but the Lord knows how to deliver those, um, the godly out of their temptation. So, the angels who sinned, he cast them down into hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, where they await that time at the great white throne judgment. You can read that in the book of Revelation, and they are judged. And he did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly in the fear of now, raised in the church, you know the Sunday school story about the flood and Noah building the ark and all the animals came on two by two and he shut up the ark and it rained for 40 days and 40 nights and the world was flooded at the top of the mountains and everything that had breath perished except for those eight souls on board the boat. And so Peter uses this as an example, right? Yes, it's a dark world. It's a wicked world. In fact, when he flooded the world, we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, it says, the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They were beyond salvation. There is a place the scripture teaches. You can walk up to that line, you can walk up to that line, but that line must not be crossed. And I don't know where that line is for you or I. In uh, Timothy, Paul teaches Timothy that you get to a certain point and it's like your mind is cauterized. You have no longer any feeling or any desire at all for the things of God or for heaven and you just are not interested in that. And 
This is what happened to the people who lived prior to the flood. Except for Noah, God looked on Noah and saw he was a really great businessman, so he saved him. <laughs> You're okay. I'm sorry, here it comes. Okay, so he was a really great businessman. This might make sense in light of the stock market for those of you who are watching the economy right now. It says, or it doesn't say, but I say. Uh, Noah was able to float all of his stock while the entire world was in liquidation. I gotta do one of these a week or you'll think what happened. <laughs> but we know the story. And here's the story. This is what Peter is trying to say. Yes, the world is dark. Yes, we're being flooded with iniquity and wickedness and, and it's just amazing all the wicked things are coming on the world. But God spared Noah. There is a way of escape. He goes on to talk about Lot, okay, and the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, and condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Okay, remember Lot's wife. Anybody ever heard that story? Right? Because as they were fleeing the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Angels were actually sent, and they actually had to grab a hold of Lot and his wife and his daughters and drag them out of the city, snatch them out of the destruction, and he says he rained down hellfire and brimstone on that, right? Sulfur, and just turned it to ash. Snatched them out of it. Um, but he was able to deliver righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. And this parenthesis here is one of my favorite parentheses in the whole Bible. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. If you didn't read that in the New Testament commentary on that Old Testament story found in Genesis 18, 19, you would just, you'd wonder if you'd see Lot in heaven. What was he doing? Abraham says, our flocks have grown too big. We need to just part from one another. Now you look all around and you take whatever you want. You can take up these hills up here, these arid hilltops, or down there's the plains of Sodom and Gomorrah, green and fertile. Lot, his nephew, probably should have deferred to his uncle, but he said, I'll take that. I'll take all of that. And he moved down to the plains, and then it says he moved outside the city. Next thing you know, he's in the city. Next thing you know, he's at the gate of the city, which means he's a leader of that community. But that community was filled with wickedness. All different kinds of terrible, terrible things were going on in there. And it says that here in the New Testament, we see that his soul was tormented day by day. This gives me hope. Because I can sometimes question my standing before God. What am I doing here? What is happening with me? I would encourage you by this. This is an encouragement I feel the Lord has given me. We are still, as children of God, walking with that sin nature. That Paul would say this in Romans chapter 7. The things that I would not do, I do. The things that I do, I don't. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? And you may understand that. Paul wrote that decades into his Christian life. And he struggled. His soul was tormented. Temptation. Sin. The question is, do you struggle with it, or do you just give into it? Righteous Lot, he's righteous. God declares him righteous. We'll see him in heaven. He struggled with it, but God snatched him away. I love this in the story of Lot. Peter brings us in, and he's going to go into it in even better detail next chapter, but we know that there is a day coming when we, who suffer in this current world, 
who deal with the tribulations of life can be of good cheer. Because Jesus has overcome the world. He's overcome the grave. He's overcome death. He's ascended to heaven. And he will return to snatch you and me just like Lot out of this wicked world. That word snatch. Harpazo in Latin raptus where we get the rapture. God will not allow us to go through the destruction that's coming upon a Christ-rejecting world. It says in verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the ungodly out of temptation. Well, of course he does. He's the Lord. He can do as he pleases, and he's got it all dialed in. And if you ever stop and question that, you can look at these stories and see God's done it. God's done it in the ancient days. God's done it and not so many years ago, and God's doing it in my life. He came into my life when I was just a reprobate <laughs> sinner, and he snatched me away from my old life, my old lifestyle, and all that wickedness, till at this point, for me personally, praise God, it's over half a lifetime ago. But it doesn't matter if it was yesterday for you. The whole point is, you've been snatched out, okay? It even says uh, in, in, in uh, the scriptures, it says, if you've been saved or plucked from the fire and your hair isn't even singed and there's no smell of smoke on your garments. When God gets a hold of you and brings you into his kingdom, out of darkness and into his marvelous light, he cleans you up. He makes you a new creature in Christ. The old man is dead. All things have become new. And you walk on from that day forward into eternity. The moment that you confess Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, you are born again. You are born from above. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are a child of God. And you have just changed your eternal destiny. You are now headed to heaven. You are now currently living in eternity. This is our eternity. We have a little bit to finish here on this present earth, but it goes on. You never die. You skipped the second death. You died to yourself. You came alive to Christ, and you go on forever. And what the world calls death for a Christian is simply a portal. It's simply a door. You walk through the door, and you walk into your glory. Okay? And this is, this is exciting stuff, but these false preachers don't want you to know this stuff. They want to... They get you in their clutches. They want to shake you down, right? They want to fleece the flock. They want to make merchandise of you. And you don't have to go very far. You can go to television. I don't know. I, don't, I haven't watched it in a thousand years now, but used to be, and they probably still are on Sunday mornings, all these churches, all these teachers, and a lot of them just shaking down the flock. It's amazing how many of them, I know back in the day I would watch them, could go through a whole hour service and have five altar calls and all kinds of donations and ads interrupting. If you give now, and your faith money will be increased and you'll get super wealthy, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then you go through a whole hour and not even mention the name of Jesus. Just their ministry. Our ministry. Our ministry this. Our ministry that. They're prescription bottles with a false label. It says, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly up out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment, especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a revival accusation against them before the Lord. And this again is an allusion to Jude in verses 8 through 10 where Michael, the archangel, argued with Satan over the body of Moses. We don't know a whole lot about the backstory on this, but one thing we do know is that Jude records when they were arguing, Michael, the archangel, and Satan over who gets the body of Moses, Michael, the archangel, talking to Lucifer, Satan, the angel, didn't say, I'm going to get you, or... Whatever. He said, the Lord rebuke you. He wouldn't even bring up reviling accusation against Satan himself. But these false prophets, they're arrogant, they're presumptuous, they're proud. They're quick to just uh, say all kinds of wicked and evil things. 
um, to other people. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries or literally glorious ones, people in authority and power. Whereas the angels who are greater in power might not and might do not bring a reviving accusation against them. Okay, verses 12 through 17. I gotta keep moving here. <laughs> and again, we don't need to wallow in this too much. You get the idea. But we do need to be careful. We need to be careful. There are people who will come into the church and they'll bring in all kinds of heresies. I was one of those, potentially, at one time. I was raised up in the Methodist church. I'm not knocking that so much, although I would have nothing to do with them today in all of the different doctrines that they are welcoming every form of sin into their church. But there are good Methodists out there. Okay? I'm not bagging on a person or even a group of people that go to a specific church. And I know pastors in our own area who minister at Methodist churches and they struggle with some of the things that are being given them to share amongst their fellowship. But that's how I was raised. I fell away from it. And I walked off and just tripped through the smorgasbord of world religions and philosophies and looked into you know, the occult, I looked into Eastern religion, Hinduism, Shintoism, I looked into uh, Islam, I studied the world religions, I looked at different philosophies of life, you know, uh, hedonism, I got really, I got like a bachelor's degree in that. Um, and I could have easily, as a Christian, brought all that baggage with me. In fact, I remember as I became a Christian and I recognized that everything that the Bible said is true, every time I would test it, man, it just lines right up with reality like I see it. All these other isms and gurus out there did not. They always had something that just didn't quite line up. I recognized I needed to give my life to Jesus Christ. I was a sinner. I needed a Savior. I put my life in Jesus' hand. And I just trusted in Him. I began reading His Word. I began praying. I began fellowshipping. I, be, I started to know the God of the Scriptures and test and see that it was true. But I also realized as a baby Christian, I needed to detox. I was so full of worldly stuff. And especially health, wealth, and prosperity doctrine. I had spent a stint in the Church of Christian Scientists. I had been in all this stuff. And you get confused. Which is right? Which is wrong? How do I know the difference? And it took me several years. I felt like Paul, when he came to Christ, spent years in the desert. I had to go and just get away from all that stuff. And just listen to the Word. Listen to the Lord. And test these things out. And over time, I left that stuff behind. And a lot of that is because I built a foundation of God's Word in my heart. And that I knew what was true. But it's real easy for a person to come to know the Lord. And in the next minute, man, they're going on. They're, they're full of zeal. They're excited. They're born again. They're new creatures. But sometimes, their doctrine is a little bit lacking, needs some bolstering, needs some strengthening, right? So that can happen. So here's the depravity, really the character of, of, of these false um, teachers in verse 12. But these, like natural brute beasts, okay? Natural. If that's one of the things that's been going around in the world since I was a kid. and It's almost taken as a, as a fact now that the human species is really of the same level as the insect species or the um, fish species or, or whatever. We're just all animals. You know, it's, it's, it's Darwin, it's evolution, it's all this stuff that people have been pumping us for a long time. You're just an animal. And it's not amazing to me that you go to this generation that we live in, and I'm not talking about, you know, generation X, Y, Z, W, whatever. I'm talking about this time in history, our group, our generation, 
We have been taught so much that we're animals. And then we stand back and wonder, why do they act like animals? You were created in the image of God. He created you like Him. Body, soul, and spirit. But these natural brute beasts do not have the spirit of God. That died. When you die, you are separated from the spirit of God. When you, when you sin, you are separated. You die to the spirit of God. And that's what happened to every human being until Christ came to redeem us, to regenerate us, to make us that new creation through the power of his Holy Spirit. But these aren't regenerated. They're unregenerate. They're animalistic, okay? They just, they're interested in their belly. They're list, interested in their lust and their desires and their passions. That's what controls them or governs them. These, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed. Interesting. Just a little side note. Made to be caught and destroyed. Right? That's just a, that's a terrible place to be where you're just out there running for your life and Satan's just on your tail, doing everything he can to run you down and destroy you. May be caught and destroyed, speak evil of all things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption. Made their bed sleep in it, okay? And will receive the wages of unrighteousness. The wages of sin is every single time. You sin, the wages are death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. They will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who counted pleasure to carouse in the daytime, okay? Or revel openly. Just going on. It's a party. I don't care about God. I don't think I care about the church. I don't care about you. I'm just doing what I like. If it feels good, do it. You know, eat, drink, and be merry. They're reveling openly. They're carousing in the daytime. They are spots and blemishes. Uh, Jude Paul talks about this. It says, even at your love feast. Spots and blemishes. They're impurity. They're, 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 they bring... Um, they don't, I, I, don't, I don't want to say they don't look good, because I'm not looking at the outward appearance, but even amongst us as we gather together in these love feasts, the, the scriptures describe them as agape feasts, is what we have here at the church. We gather together and we break bread together. We have communion. We have the sacraments. We have the fellowship hall. We have the potluck, the agape feast. But there are some who will come into that and they'll act all holy. They'll talk all holy. They'll walk all holy. But they're secret. They've got destruct destructive doctrines. They need to be um, watched out for. Spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. Having eyes full of adultery. And literally that's the word adulteress is. But the idea here is that their eyes are not on God. They're on everything but God. They're, they're after all the ungodly things. And that, you know, their focus is not God, but their own goals. They have, they are eyes full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. Okay? They, they just continually, habitually, can just go on and on and on, wantonly, with no conviction, they just sin. That's a sad place to be. It's a beautiful thing. These are the un unregenerate, but when you are regenerated, when you're made new, you're made alive in Christ, you get the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, one of his jobs is to convict you. He convicts you of sin. Uh-uh, uh-uh, that's wrong. These people don't have that conviction. Conviction of sin, of righteousness. Hey, that would be a good thing to do. Holy Spirit, he's regenerated you. And of judgment. There's coming a day of reward. The reward for the righteous is glory. The reward for the unrighteous is damnation. So he says, um, they have a heart trained in covetous practices. Are you really good at sinning? I, you know, I, I don't need to ask you that question. This is that moment in the message I probably should just stop and say, if these fiery darts are flying through your head, put on your shield of faith. We of like precious 
faith, knowing that the work was done 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, do not need to fear the fiery darts of the devil who says, you were this wicked person. You were so trained in sin. That was. That man's dead. You, you have no hold on me there. But you want to just make sure you don't get down that rabbit hole too bad. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are our first children. I'm just going to kind of take you over to Romans chapter 1. You don't have to turn there, but you might want to. I'm going to read a chunk. It's an echo of what Peter just talked about. These are the false teachers, deceptive people, taking people to destruction with them. In Romans chapter 1, I'm going to pick up at verse 22. It says, professing to be wise, right? They're professors, right? Just like in the universities and the colleges, they profess to be wise. They professing to be wise, they become fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, brute beasts, and birds, and four footed animals, and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up. Oh, you never want to hear somebody, God, say that to you. But they don't care about the things of God. They gave up God long before he ever gave them up. But at a certain point, you want to run down that road long enough and you don't struggle with temptation, you don't care. You're not ashamed. You're not embarrassed. There comes a day you cross that line and God says, if that's, if that's your passion and desire, if that's your life's goal, it breaks my heart. But that's where you're going to live. It says, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. That would be lesbians. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in lust for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving the, in themselves the penalty of their own error, which was due. That's homosexuality. Okay? Fundamentally, and I just wanted to say it straight up, this is not the way God created us to live. He created us male and female, that we would live according to the order that he established. You go ahead and live outside those lines and, and, and choose to ignore God, then you're going to end up in the place that takes you. Okay? And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness. That's like those people whose thoughts of their hearts were evil continually before the flood. Filled with unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Shame on so many denominations who are now approving of people who practice one or the other or many of these things in the name of love and inclusivity. You cannot water down the doctrine of God to the point that it has no effect. That's taking that good prescription and diluting it to the point that there is no health in it anymore. You've changed the contents. The label no longer fits. It's no longer effective. Okay? Uh, and I'm trying to get out of this chapter for you guys, but that was a long list from Paul. 
Peter, in just this short section, since we started verse 2, discussing these false teachers, has described them this way. This is an amazing list we've already covered. They do things in secret. They deny, they deny Jesus' finished redemption. They blaspheme the truth. They're covetous. They have used deceptive words. They live an ungodly lifestyle. They walk according to the flesh. They despise authority. They're natural brute beasts. They don't have the Holy Spirit. They speak evil, evil in uh, ignorance. They carouse openly. They're unaware of their own faults. They're adulteresses. They can't stop sinning continually. They go after the weak, the sick, the young, and the stragglers. And they're trained in covetousness and wickedness. And it says of them, they are accursed children. That word for accursed is damned. They are destined for the lake of fire. I can't make it any plainer than that. Verse 15. They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Baor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he was rebuked for his iniquity. A dumb donkey, speaking with a man's voice, restrained the madness of the prophet. So, you know that story. You get it back in the book of Numbers, chapter 20 through 25. But there was a man of God. He was hired by King Balak to curse the Israelites as they were trying to come into the promised land. He paid him money to go up on a mountain and prophesy curses upon Israel because he knew that he couldn't withstand the God of Israel, but maybe a man of God could curse Israel. Every time open, Balaam opened up his mouth to speak, blessings came out instead of curses. And uh, long story short is Balaam followed after, it says here, uh, loving the wages of unrighteousness, greed. This is one of the things that earmarks a false prophet. Somebody who does not speak forth the truth of God. They're greedy. They're looking for what they might get out of the deal. Paul warned Timothy about this when he wrote to him in 1 Timothy chapter 6. He told them, oops, I got the marker in the wrong place. Here we go. He told them in uh, chapter 6, beginning at verse 6, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. Nothing quite like just having a godly heart, heart set on God, God filling you with His Holy Spirit, convicting you of righteousness, and you're just loving your life with the Lord, and free of the shame, of guilt, laying your head on your pillow at night, and just sleeping sweet dreams, and just loving your life, Right? Godliness with contentment. Not striving after gain or profit or greed like Balaam. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Nothing wrong with money. Nothing wrong with prosperity. God is the God of prosperity. God owns all the silver and all the gold. God owns the cattle and a thousand hills. And there are so many Examples in the scriptures of godly men who became extremely prosperous. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. But if you're seeking all these things, what good is it if a man gains the whole world and loses his soul? You get your priorities in the right place. Okay? These are wells without water, clouds carried by a tempest, for whom is observed blackness and darkness forever. I like it. Jude says something very, very similar in verse 12 of Jude. These are spots in your love feast, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. No fruit in their trees. 
just as Jesus has said. Don't know them by their fruit. They're pulled up by their root. Okay? Um, for when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, I'm, I'm back at First Peter, I'm um, Second Peter, chapter two, eighteen. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also is he brought into bondage. You can't serve two gods. You can serve God or man, but you can't do both. For if, and this is a huge if, we're coming into a hypothetical right here, okay? And I know after the service, somebody's going to come up and ask me, do you think a person that's born again can lose their salvation? And I'll tell you right now, my salvation is Jesus Christ. Christ cannot be lost, okay? I may turn my back on them, I may walk away from them, but Christ is never lost. You are secure in Christ. Jesus says they are my sheep and no one can snatch them out of my hand. You're eternally secure in God. But this is one of the places in the scriptures amongst many in the New Testament that warn against dancing on the fence. Walking right up to the edge and seeing if you can live on that fence. T. Home, who owns the fence? The devil owns the fence. You know, I've got to get off the fence, right? Okay, and this is what's this is a very um, precarious place to be. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them to have not known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to his own vomit. That's a quote out of Proverbs 26.11. It says a dog returns to his own prophet, so a fool returns to his folly. So it happens, a dog returns to his own vomit, and a sow having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Both that dog and that sow, those are brute beasts, unregenerate spirits. They don't have the Holy Ghost. They are not children of God. They have not been sealed in the Holy Spirit. Just as Hebrews chapter 6, and I don't have time to unpack this, but in Hebrews chapter 6, it talks about those who, having tasted May, having tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if, again, one of the biggest little words in the Bible, if they fall away, hypothetical, to renew, renew themselves again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Fundamentally, what Paul just, not Paul, what the author of Hebrews just said in Hebrews, and what Peter just said here is, you can't be born again, again, again. Again, again. You get born again once. You become a new creation in Christ. You are sealed. You are bound for glory. You're a child of heaven. You are a king's kid. You are the bride of Christ. You are taken away from the wrath of God. And glory is your destiny. Okay? But, if you're one of those people that's just playing on the fence, trying to decide, I'm going to listen to these people, I'm going to listen to that guy. Ooh, that health, wealth, and prosperity offering. That sounds like mine. Be careful. Be extremely careful. In fact, I would say, get away from the fence. Get back here where it's safe. Don't even go there. Stand on the foundation, the solid foundation of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. We're going to wrap this up. I asked them to sing again. I changed their set. Did you get it, Rosemary? Is he worthy? And I want you to think about these words. You know, when we come to church, there's a time for fellowship. I pray that Christ is the head of every conversation we have. There's a time for worship. But I want you to think about the lyrics that you sing. This isn't just filler material to try to... I'll pep you up with some music. 
This is a time where we take something in our heart and we speak it to God in song. We lift up our voices. Our praise magnifies Him in this place. So I want you to think about the song there about this thing. As we think about this, and think about what Peter has had to say. It's true. The world is getting darker all the time. I, I would love to get up here and tell you, oh, peace, peace, prosperity, it's all going to be good. That's not how the Bible describes the last days. That's not how we see things in the world today. But when you see all this wickedness, all this darkness, all this cancel culture, all this hypocritical media and politics, all of this perversion, all of this wickedness that these teachers are trying to shove down our throat, down the throats of our children in the schools and, and just everywhere. When you see all those things, church, look up. The redemption draws nigh. Jesus is knocking on the door. We just need to stay faithful. Father God, I want to just ask this morning, that is, we've shared this message of those who try to dilute, pollute, corrupt your church, that you would search our hearts, see if there's any wicked way in us. As David would say, purge us with this. Uh, clean our hearts that we may be made new and declare your glories to the world. I pray as we've had a very sobering message this morning that we, the Springs, would accept the responsibility for standing up for the truth speaking the truth, rejoicing in the truth, declaring your word, Jesus, the spirit of all prophecy wrapped up in you. Help us always keep our eyes fixed on you, our bright and morning star, as we see you coming for us soon and very, very, very soon. We thank you, Lord, for this morning, this time to just gather up and connect and just be uh, encouraged. I ask, Lord, now that you would allow us each to depart in your Holy Spirit and give you a will in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen.